ITN headquarters, the early evening news with Carol Barnes. John Major warned today, don't expect too much from this week's Earth Summit. Environmental groups agreed, but they say that's because Britain and the United States are sabotaging the Rio summit before it's even begun. They say Britain looks likely to follow America in refusing to sign one of the key treaties. The Prime Minister, on a visit to Scotland today, warned against expecting too much from the Rio summit. He stressed that it was just the beginning, not the end of a process. I'm very keen for us to make progress generally at the Rio summit, but I have been warning for some time that some of the expectations from the Rio summit are higher than those that can realistically be achieved. But with the Environment Secretary Michael Howard making it clear he has doubts about the treaty to protect wildlife, the government was being accused of sabotaging the summit before it began. I think at the moment what we're seeing is government ministers going to Rio totally empty-handed both in terms of putting our own house in order and in terms of helping the poorer countries. What it amounts to is a total reluctance by two of the wealthiest countries in the world to in any way help the poorest countries of the world to tackle the environmental problem, uh, which is going to engulf all of us. Environmentalists warned of the dangers to plants and wildlife of not signing the treaty. If the rich nations don't provide some money to help developing countries uh, conserve their animals and plants, then those developing countries aren't going to have the resources to do it. And as a result, we're likely to see many species become extinct. And that, of course, is going to diminish the whole web of life, web of life upon which we, ultimately, as human beings, also depend. The summit begins in two days' time. The British government won't take a final decision on whether to sign the treaty until several days of negotiations are over. Jackie Ashley, ITN, Westminster. Jackie, why is the government dithering over the treaty? Well, as so much in politics, Carol, it comes down to a question of money. There is in the treaty at the moment a clause which says that all the participating nations will decide how much the donor nation should give. The government say this is really amounting to a blank cheque, and it's a blank cheque at the moment they're not prepared to sign. Having said that, they're not saying like the Americans they definitely won't sign the treaty. They're hoping over the next few days in negotiations in Rio to reach some agreement, so all is not lost yet. Are they really taking Rio seriously, though? Up to a point, you heard the Prime Minister earlier today saying we shouldn't expect too much from Rio. While the Prime Minister has been keen to go to Rio and keen to support a lot of what's going on, he's well aware that there is a recession on at the moment and environmental measures inevitably cost money. The Prime Minister isn't going to do too much at the moment that's either going to hit industry or that's going to mean the government paying out a lot of money. So I think it's up to a point, one can say, the government's taking it seriously, but not too much. Jackie Ashley, thank you. The latest from the Earth Summit in Rio next. Plus, reports still to come in the early evening news. Top policewoman says discrimination cost her her promotion. Plea for safer electric car windows after toddler is killed. And the winner of the biggest ever slot machine jackpot. President Bush will tell the world what he thinks about the environment in a major speech in just over an hour's time. He's expected to announce a big increase in American aid to countries trying to conserve their forests. But his critics in Rio say the only green issue he understands is the colour of money. On Copacabana Beach, you wouldn't even know that a world summit starts in Rio in two days. But in the city's squalid slums, to people like Maria Bernardo, who lives in a drainage pipe, the problems of world poverty are brutally clear. Already there are signs that the most extraordinary summit ever might not be able to come to grips with the crises facing the world. Take forests. Tonight, President Bush will announce a $100 million program to help save forests in the third world. Critics say he's just trying to divert attention from his refusal to sign the proposed Rio Convention on Forests. For President Bush, green is the color of money. And he really, uh, he's, he's just portraying himself as an environmental president. He's going to come down here, stand on a green soapbox, make a lot of great speeches. But in fact, he's been the biggest obstacle to, to really changing the course that, that the planet is on toward a more environmentally sound future. But Maurice Strong, the summit secretary general, says it must not fail. The people of the world are just not just going to accept failure from their leaders. They're not going to allow it. They know their future is at stake. They're going to hold their leaders accountable for what they do or fail to do here in Rio. We must not let it fail. We simply won't have another chance in our times, if ever. If Maurice Strong is right, and this really is the last chance to save the planet, 
The international splits that are already emerging suggest it would be foolish to expect too much from this summit. Lawrence McGinty, ITN, Rio de Janeiro. Here, a top policewoman who claims she's a victim of sex discrimination says she suffered years of misery under her former chief constable. Alison Hallford, an assistant chief constable in the Merseyside force, told a tribunal Sir Kenneth Oxford was abrasive, aggressive and dogmatic. Morning, Peck. Are you well? Miss Hallford was in cheerful mood as she arrived at the tribunal to start giving evidence. Under questioning from her counsel, Eldred Debashnik QC, she described how she enjoyed a honeymoon period when she was appointed an assistant chief constable of Merseyside. But that didn't last, and problems emerged between her and the then chief constable, Sir Kenneth Oxford. Miss Holford said Sir Kenneth was horrible to her. He was abrasive, demanding, dogmatic, and outright rude. She also had an uneasy relationship with his deputy, but got on well with her fellow assistant chief constables, one of whom she described as a real sweetie. Earlier, the tribunal had heard about Miss Holford's career with the Metropolitan Police. She told them that as a young detective, she found herself dealing almost exclusively with crimes involving women, which she found oppressive. She said women officers are seen in the service as only capable of handling that sort of specialist work. The tribunal must decide whether Miss Holford was sexually discriminated against when she was passed over nine times for promotion to the highest ranks. The case is expected to last several weeks. Jim Buchanan, ITN, Manchester. The Prime Minister said today that he wouldn't allow narrow-minded nationalism in Scotland to weaken the union with England. He told businessmen in Ayrshire that traditional ties and joint membership of the European community were vital for Scotland's prosperity. In the appropriate setting of a cattle market in Dumfries today, the Prime Minister was well aware of his promise to take stock of the constitutional situation in Scotland after the election. But he wasn't giving anything away about policy initiatives. The Prime Minister chose instead to launch another strong defence of the Union, confident that the winning of two extra Conservative seats here in the election marked a turning of the tide against separatism in Scotland. In a speech to the Chamber of Commerce in Presswick, Mr Major attacked the whole concept of devolution. Don't let anyone imagine for a second that devolution offers a comfortable halfway house to anything. You simply could not create a second tax-raising parliament in Scotland without adding to the costs of business here, driving away investment and driving away jobs. You couldn't bolt on a second parliament to our constitution without altering the whole delicate balance of that constitution. Devolution is a halfway step. Yes, it is. But it is a step halfway across a chasm. But the Prime Minister did drop a broad hint that some changes may be on the way. He said that defending the Union didn't mean that government can never evolve. Most political analysts believe that means a thorough overhaul in the system of local government. David Chazar, ITN, Presswick in Scotland. Britain expelled Yugoslavia's ambassador in London today. It's in line with UN sanctions imposed against Serbia and Montenegro because of the fighting in Bosnia. Britain also revoked export licenses and suspended flights to Belgrade. By deciding to expel Belgrade's ambassador, Britain is showing its determination to make these sanctions hit hard. Under the terms of the UN resolution, they could have asked more junior officials to leave. Though silent this afternoon, the ambassador can be in no doubt about the diplomatic message he must take home with him. And the Foreign Secretary underlined that message after discussing the crisis with the new German Foreign Minister. For the first time, British comments...